views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello everyone and welcome to OpenBX Arts Remote brought to you from my living workspace, Chari Executive Suite, I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Cafe Con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we kick off American Heart Month with a National Wear Red Day as we bring awareness to cardiovascular disease among women. After that, we'll speak to the curator and artist of the Riverdale Wise Gallery 18 second annual exhibition celebrating Black History Month entitled, If Not Now, When? Then we'll be joined by Enhanced by Nature owner Jamila Shapsiding to discuss her organic plant-based personal care line for healthy pampering just in time for Valentine's Day. Later on in the show, Bobby C brings us an up-to-date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features singer and songwriter Nikki Elia, who discusses her latest song, Earth is Ghetto, that went viral, and she'll close us out performing a debut version of it live here on Open BXRX at the end of the show. So sit back y preparate. All this and more is headed your way. Because now we are officially open. <laughs> to open and uh well happy black history month i'm rena valentin your host of cafe con leche for the next hour inviting you to get social with us tweet us and follow us on instagram at bronxnet tv or like us on facebook at open bronxnet television and of course while you're there you can follow moi on twitter fb instagram insta stories and linkedin at rena valentin so although we're still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, heart disease remains the number one cause of death among women, killing one in three women every year. And today for National Wear Red Day, we bring aware, we're gonna bring awareness to uh, heart health, uh, discussing the impact it has on women of color, along with well, some preventative tips as we kick off American Heart Month. Joining me today, we welcome Dr. Rachel Maria Brown and Bronx resident and American Heart Association volunteer, Natasha. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Hi. Hello, good morning. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, doctor. So um, let's talk about uh, your involvement with the American Heart Association first, uh, Dr. Brown. Good morning. So I'll just do a brief introduction. I'm Dr. Rachel Maria Brown Talaska. I'm an assistant professor of cardiology at the Zephyr School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I'm the director for inpatient cardiac services at Lenox Hill Hospital Northwell Health. I've been working with the American Heart Association on raising the alarm for um, heart disease in women and uh, heart health disparities in women of color. As an Afro-Latina, our community is at a disproportionate impact from heart disease and stroke. And I think uh, knowledge is power and we should spread information, awareness and education in our community. Yes, and thank you for bringing it here to our viewers. Um, and we're gonna learn more uh, once we get to meet Natasha who happens to be a volunteer, right? Yes, ma'am, hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you. So I, we just want to get to know you a little bit and, and how long you've been a volunteer and I guess what uh, brought you to this place of just being health conscious with regards to uh, preventing heart disease. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, so my name is Natasha Richards and I've been volunteering with American Heart Associate for um, about the last two years now. Um, and so I started out volunteering with them basically to share my story and letting people know, um, just put a face to um, weight loss and um, letting people know that they can too can have a healthy heart and basically, um, you know, having 
introducing cardio um, as a source of um, just basically making your, yourself, your lifestyle and your heart healthier. Yes, it, it is important. It is a mindset. And um, it's, we're blessed to have Dr. Brown with us here so that she can, uh, I guess, shed some light on, um, on some of the statistics that are out there, especially pertaining to our community, um, as in uh, what we addressed in uh, being uh, very uh, effective here within the uh, people of color community. So I, I oh, just yeah. want everyone to know that cardiovascular disease kills a substantial portion of American, uh, African American women every year. So that's nearly 50,000, 50,000 a year. That's more than cancer, accidents, assault, Alzheimer's disease combined affecting black women, cardiovascular disease. Right? If we zoom out by ethnicity and then break it down by gender, it's even more shocking. You know, in the African American or black American community, 30% more likely to die of heart disease, 40% more likely to have high blood pressure, which we call hypertension twice as likely to have a stroke or have diagnosis of diabetes, higher rates of obesity, heart attack, or death from a heart attack. So when you break that down to black women, the statistics are rather shocking. Over half of black women have cardiovascular disease. Over half of black women age 20 or older have high blood pressure. So this is not a disease of the elderly and infirm anymore. This is affecting our adolescent young adult uh, age groups. 80%, over 80% of black women have obesity or they are diagnosed as being overweight. When we break it down into our non-white Hispanics, Puerto Ricans have the highest hypertension related death rate of all Hispanic subgroups combined. Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans have twice the rate of diabetes compared to their non-Hispanic white counterparts. So what about non-white Hispanic women? A third of Hispanic adult women have cardiovascular disease and over 75% of Hispanic adult women are overweight or obese. So these statistics are alarming, but we can do something about it. So before we go to Natasha, really quickly, um, does that have to do with the DNA or does it have to do with diet? There are multiple factors and I, I like to break it down into things you can control and things you cannot control. You cannot control your DNA. You cannot right. control your genetic predilection or predisposition to having a disease. What can you control? You can control your diet, your exercise, your weight, your tobacco, right? whether you're smoking or not, alcohol intake. And these are contingent upon many things. Do you have access to good nutrition? Do you have access to safe ways of exercising? Do you have access to adequate health care? Do you have access to health insurance? Do you have access to a care provider? So all of these things sort of coalesce into you know, the health of a, of a woman and reducing risk of cardiovascular disease. And if you have it, proper treatment of that cardiovascular disease. So I want to just uh, speak to Natasha a bit about uh, what she's done to uh, alter her lifestyle, um, be it through eating, be it through exercise, and, and also when when did you have this wake up call? So um, I was I actually went to the doctor. I was having this stomach problem. Um, I had um, basically I, I had went to the doctor just like on a whelm, something totally unrelated. Um, and when, when I got to the doctor, I found out that day that I was 336 pounds. And so besides the whatever little reason I went to the doctor, like that totally went out the window and found when I found out, you know, that was literally just getting on that scale and finding out that 336, that was my wake up call. Um, literally that day, um, walking home from the doctor's office, I called my husband and he's, uh, you know, the doctor's office is about um, I'll say about seven blocks away from home. And I was, um, you know, I was calling him. He expected, he was like, oh, babe, I'm sorry. Am I late? He was going to come pick me up. And so um, walking home, I told him, no, don't come pick me up. I'm 336 pounds. And so just walking home that day, it all came to me, you know, just how my weight and my health and my eating, how, um, how it's really affected me. And so literally that day, um, that set off the alarm for me. And it just made me um, really just change my mind starting that day um, with the foods that I was eating and, you know, my exercise regimen and so forth. So how long ago was that? That was two years ago. Okay. Um, and so where are you now? Fast forward two years. 
Um, so fast forward two years, I lost about 96 pounds. Um, bravo, I was doing, bravo, bravo. Thank you. I have, I've had some, it's been, it's been up and down. It, it has it's been, definitely well, been up Well, it's a little challenge. These are challenging times. So it's understanding, but however, yes. it's all about the consciousness. And so, um, you lost 96 pounds. So what is it that you did that, uh, created this transformation? Um, literally that day, um, started eating, um, <laughs> exercising, like, but you know, I tell people all the time, the most important thing is to find exercise that you like. There's so many different types of exercises out here, finding the right support groups, exercise. I mean, I did, um, Zumba and, um, even in these challenging times, I go back to the videos of me doing Zumba on face, you know, on, li on lives and um, seeing myself dancing with my friends, you know, with my right. workout friends. And I had so much fun, so much fun. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I, that's wonderful. And thank you for sharing that. And thank you for mm -hmm. mentioning that it is important for one to really find joy in their physical activity because that makes all the difference. Doctor, before we go, are there any last words that you could share with us uh, or our viewers, I should say, that could uh, just put everybody on the right path, especially since we're here wearing red in honor of uh, American Heart Month? So we are wearing red in order to raise awareness and spread awareness in the effort to combat and eradicate heart disease among women and women of color in America. So what I want you to do is know your numbers, right? This is an American Heart Association theme. Know your numbers, know your blood pressure, know your cholesterol, know your fasting blood sugar, or if you have diabetes, your hemoglobin A1C. And if you want to know how to avoid things like that, know your family history, your genetic predisposition to these diseases so you can do what you can to what we say, mitigate, reduce your risk of developing these diseases in young adult life as some studies are showing. The statistics are rising with young adult um, women of black and Hispanic ethnicity developing heart attack and stroke early on and talk to your doctor about how to prevent heart disease. We as cardiologists do not only treat disease, we are preventative or health maintenance doctors. We want to prevent the stroke, prevent the heart attack, prevent end events, right? And so you don't just see your doctor when you have a problem, you see your doctor to maintain good health. And that's what I, I want to convey. Beautiful, thank you. I like that so slogan, uh, uh, preventative, <laughs> prevents events, right? That's what you just said. Prevention <laughs> prevents events. Prevention, prevention prevents events. I like that. That's the, those are wise words from Dr. Rachel Maria Brown. And thank you both for being here with us. Uh, Natasha Richards, uh, Bronx resident, American Heart Association volunteer and inspiration. Uh, you guys, once again, for more information regarding heart disease and prevention, you can visit uh, heart.org. And for more information on the Go Red for Women initiative, you can visit goredforwomen.org. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll discuss the Riverdale Wise exhibition celebrating Black History Month. Don't go anywhere. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's gonna go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Hey everyone, welcome back in celebration as we continue celebrating that is Black History Month. Uh, Gallery 18 at the Riverdale Y has created an exhibition showcasing the Black Lives Matters movement through art. And the theme and title of the exhibition is If Not Now, When? and it seeks to capture the spirit of movement and spark conversations surrounding the racial divide in America. 
Joining us to tell us more, we welcome curator Maria Noida and visual artist Dennis Shelton and Ken Jackson. Hello and welcome. Welcome, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Uh, so Maria, let's start with you as the curator of this exhibition and what that's been like for you based on, um, well, you know, the new norm of having to pivot in the way we're curating and dealing and communicating and or probing through different artwork to uh, even establish a, an exhibition. Um, it's very personal for me because um, it, you can tell looking at me that I've acquired a certain number of birthdays. And I never thought at this point in my life that I would be living through a historic moment. And in fact, I'm living through two. And that is the pandemic as well as the, uh, the eruption of the Black Lives Matter protests this summer following the killing of George Floyd all over the world. And that intersection of those two moments brought me up short, as I'm sure it did a whole lot of people, and said to me, what's my role here? What do I do in this moment? Do I let history pass me by? Or do I step in in some way? And that dovetailed very, very nicely with the words of Hillel the Elder, who um, it was a very influential, very important religious, Jewish religious leader, um, by all accounts, a very compassionate man. And he had a number of very interesting um, uh, statements to make, but there is one that is well known, and it's in, in three parts. And the first part is, if I am not for myself, then who is for me? And that's the responsibility to stand up on your own. And the second part is, but if I am only for myself, then what am I? And that's the responsibility to take care of others. And the third is, if not now, when? And that really spoke to me because it said, this is the moment, this is the moment to seize, you know, because I know how it is when we go back to normal. People forget, people forget right. revelations of what the pandemic taught us, which is if it, people really need to know, um, the, the, the great social inequities in this country. And so I wanted to hold that in front of people with this exhibit. And that's what, if not now, when is all about. And I want to acknowledge the two jurors, by the way, right now, um, Ken Jackson and Dennis Shelton, because you need people who have the experience, the knowledge, the body of work to be able to evaluate other people's work, other artists' work. And I was so lucky to have them, so blessed, so happy, uh, because they did such a fabulous job. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. Well, and thank I you for that, because um, I'd like to hear from them as well. Uh, Dennis Shelton, we can start with you. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, I love that she referenced you guys as jurors. I mean, you're, I introduced you as artists, but obviously there, you come with a lot more than that. Um, just share with us what your process was and, and what this means to you, what this is all about for you. Well, I'm very happy to be part of the show, and it was a great experience to be a juror. Uh, I work with wood assemblage, broken pieces, unrelated pieces, and I put them together to create a whole. So to do that and to also have a message to uh, address this time that we're going through was a powerful experience for me. And so, um, Ken, uh, again, the, these uh, opportunities that are being presented right now are just merely a means of expressing yourself or expressing us. I, I, I relate to it as well as a person of color. And, and what uh, Maria said was that this was being brought to the forefront, but truth be told is like, it's always been there. It's just being like focused on um, because of the, the disparities and, and the inequities. Um, so having it mounted during Black History Month, uh, what do you hope people are, are really going to take away from this? Well, I'd, I'd like to see people begin to talk about it like we're talking about it. Like I always see, see art as artists, as recorders of time. So when you look back at this time, you will see what went on and, and what's going on now and why we're doing the pieces we do. 
that that is the importance of doing this show. So we have everyone talking and talking to each other about what's going on and how they feel and how we are to address this. As, especially for me as being in the schools and being an art educator, to be able to express that to my students and to everyone, and to everyone viewing the art, which is most important. The art piece that you have on display actually has the, the face of George Floyd on it, who is uh, basically, you know, unfortunately somebody who transitioned during the, the height of this pandemic and has become like this movement, right? Because uh, it's unfortunate that this has been going on way before yeah. this. It's just that this particular incident um, just pretty much put a halt to like enough is enough. Um, what does a, a piece like that hold in value? It's not just George Floyd. Like you said, this has been going on. So this piece is basically, you know, me looking at everybody, I see this. We all see this. And these people's names are not to be forgotten. Like Eric Garner, you know, Breonna Taylor, or, you know, Tamir Rice. Nobody's talking about them anymore. It's like they're forgotten. Anthony Bias. It's like they're forgotten. You know, Michael Brown. That's why I did this piece. And I wanted to put all their faces. If I could have put more faces, I, I would have put more. But because it's, it's just ridiculous how many and how this goes on and nobody really addresses it. And the importance of George, you know, George Floyd, people start to address it and they start right. to talk about it. So it became... Right. It became a movement. Black Lives Matter became, you know, central in the movement. Right. Yeah. I mean, Black Lives Matter has been going on for a while now. But um, before, I, I, I want to just talk a little bit about your, your pieces, Dennis. I, I know you, you gave us a little bit of insight. But um, the fact that you reference it as two separate Americas, uh, let's just talk a little bit about that from your perspective. Well, we live in America, but we're separate from the, the general goodness of America. So in my piece, you see we have the American flag, but we have interspersed within that American flag, the Black Liberation flag, which represents uh, people of color. And so the sizes are different, the levels are different, but we're still part of the whole. Right, I get it. And and so um, uh, what I noticed is that your pieces, they kind of resemble each other, but they also represent almost like a different period or, or, or a different aspect, like maybe a different day or a different chapter, but yet they still ha hold the same message. Well, the message is the same no matter what we experience. And as Ken said, this has been going on forever and, and we need to stop this. We need to come together as one America, one people, one message, and it needs to stop. I, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, you know, um, and that's what we're all working on together collectively. And uh, that leads me to you, Maria, to close out the segment and Sherry, uh, the, I guess, some insight behind some of the other artists being exhibited, as well as when the exhibition is going to be on display. It's on, it, well, it went up, yes, um, <laughs> I was going to say yesterday, it's from February 1st to March 1st. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, jumping off what, uh, what Shelton said, um, the, um, this, this exhibit was meant to be as interactive as possible so that people are actually faced with questions and they're also faced with not only the image, but the words of the artists that accompany every image. So I just want people to take away from this particular exhibit, what do I do, yeah? And so if the only thing, that if, if you're gonna, you know, if I'm gonna look at, at the audience and say, if the only thing you do is pass on the link to your friends and through social media, you will have taken a step because people say, oh, what can I do, you know? But it's the little steps and it's the accumulation of those steps that count. And it really has to be, um, put in front of people's faces and kept there so that there is a dialogue and there are, are steps. Beautiful, thank you. And thank you for bringing it here to our viewers. And um, I mean, you know, 
considering the circumstances, we would all love to be in the actual physical space, uh, admiring the artwork up close and personal. Yeah. However, based on it being virtual, it now uh, broadens the audience. So it's available to everybody worldwide, right? Yeah. That's it, it. May I just add that the reception will be February the 14th, uh, noon to 2 p.m. to 1.30. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, <laughs> on Valentine's Day. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, artist Dennis Shelton, Ken Jackson, and of course, curator Maria Noida. Um, uh, you guys, if not now, when? We'll be on virtual display from February 1st to March 1st with a virtual opening reception on Sunday, February 14th from 12 to 2 p.m. and uh, of course, the link for more information is riverdaleyorg slash community slash gallery 18. All right, we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll speak to American, African-American entrepreneur about her plant-based skincare line. You don't want to go anywhere. Welcome back. So the COVID-19 pandemic has brought light to so many matters, including the importance of self-care. Our next guest is bringing natural self-care wellness to the forefront with her organic skincare line, Enhance by Nature. The plant-based brand is tailored to naturally benefit the body by eliminating the use of any synthetics and chemicals. And joining us to discuss more about the products, including the special collection for Black History Month and Valentine's Day, please welcome Enhanced by Nature owner, Jamila Shamsidin. Shamsidin. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Hello, how are you doing? Yeah. I'm good. Welcome, welcome. And and when they show your name at the bottom of uh, lower thirds, they'll be able to understand why I hesitated a little bit. You've got a lot of vowels in your name. Yeah, it'll probably take up the whole screen, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. Oh my goodness, how vibrant and beautifully colorful um is your setup. Uh your Thank dress you. is lovely. Your your painting is lovely. Your products look lovely. Oh my goodness! You're just a vision. Uh, just thank to you. Thank look you. Look at. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I can't wait to share your story with everyone. Um, let's just start with the um, like the motivation behind creating natural, organic, plant-based products. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the motivation was that I am a two-time breast cancer survivor. So um, it's been, wow. <laughs> I was diagnosed the first time April of 2003. And um, from then it just went from there. I started making products for me and my family. Um, and three years ago, that was when I thought to bring it into a business after I had graduated from college. So you said twice. So the first time was 2003. I'm going to assume that you were able to eliminate it from your body and then it came back. Is that what happened? Well, with cancer, people say eliminate and um, that's not really the terminology doctors use. They say it goes into remission. Um, yeah. So it came back in the same breath. Um, thank God for that. Um, it was five years later. Okay. And then after having gone through that, and I'm assuming you're back in remission, right? We'll use the clinical terms. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you, what? You started realizing that the products that you were placing on your skin were a contribution to it 
coming back? Well, it started with my fear. I already, from the first time I started go that I start started going through breast cancer, the first time I was diagnosed, it started with my hair. I started realizing that I was perming my hair, um, putting certain chemicals in my hair that uh, just were not conducive to my body. And right. I started making my own products from my hair. And then the second time that I was diagnosed with breast cancer, it made me go even further into looking at the things that I'm putting on my skin and in my hair. And um, that's when I started making my own body butters and soaps, and then it just took off from there. Like I pretty much make everything in my house down even to my dog shampoo because animals are sensitive to the same types of things we're sensitive to as well. So what kind of research did you do to then realize, um, because some of the language of, in some of the ingredients is, right? You have to do extensive research on some yeah. of these words because you don't even know half of the stuff that's in our ingredients, you, you don't even know what they mean. Yeah, so that goes even onto our food. Um, well, the way I was raised, um, my name is a Muslim name. So my mother, I was raised as a Muslim. She was already into organic um, food, the way we ate. Um, she was a herbalist. She was um, a certified um, massage therapist. So I kind of grew up in this and I already knew this. But when you get older, you kind of convert away from the things that you learn as a child. Right. Um, so uh, as I started to realize the things that I was using as an adult wasn't good. I started researching also, my mother had gave me a book um, as well about different chemicals. And then it just went from there. Like I just started researching all the things that were in the products that I was using. I would look at, at the back of the product and I would go home and I would research and I'd be like, okay, that is a chemical. Don't want to use that. Um, right. This right here is plant-based. It means cocoa butter because um, on your products, cocoa butter is not usually said as cocoa butter. It's it's another word. Right, right, so right. Those to, are those those terms that I was saying. Medical so, terms. Right, right. And so now you have your own line. Um, I'm just trying to fast forward it so that we don't run yeah. out of time and we show what you've uh, developed and how far you've come from all of this research that you've done you know, having overcome cancer twice, uh, of course, uh, being mindful of the fact that this is also applicable to pets and of course your family. And so now you've created this limited edition line that's only going to be available what, during Black History Month. And of course, there's items in there that you can give somebody for Valentine's Day. Do you want to go over them with us really quick before we run out of time? Yeah. So um, right now, we have this soap right here. It's called oh. Apple of My Eye. And this has an apple honey, a honey apple scent. Um, honey apple for m my collection has, it was only in a body butter. I brought it out for Valentine's Day because it was a request of all my customers. It's a favorite. So I figured I would just, you know, bless them with a soap for the month. Um, so that's for Valentine's Day for all the mm -hmm. love and sweet smell. Then we have for the men, we can't forget our men. We have to, we've got to start teaching them also how to take care of their skin um, as well. Um, this is black tuxedo. Um, it's pretty much soap on a rope for them. <laughs> so, well, yeah, soap on a rope makes sure it's beautiful. <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> and it's so I just like love the consideration. I love <laughs> <laughs> She's like, well, I made a soap on a rope for the men. Yeah, so keep it simple so they could just grab it and go to the shower, hang it up. Um, and it's shaped like a box with a red red ribbon. Well, that's what it's supposed to represent. And it's right. in the center of Black Sea which is also a big seller of the men's collection for the body butter. Um, it has a very musky, but light vanilla scent to it. Um, and then 
Should I go into the other soaps that I have? Yeah, the, the, cause th this is in honor of Black History Month, right? And it's yeah. a limited yeah. edition. Yeah, before we go. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, really quickly, this is Soul Nation and it's two soaps in, in, in Can one. You pull them, bring them both and just show them to us? Yeah. So this is how they go. Nice. So this is the men. So it's called King Nation. This is the woman's soap. She's called Queen Nation. Queen Nation is scented in passion fruit. Again, another favorite of the women for my body butterfly collection. And then the men is scented in high tide. So that gives you, high tide is a new scent to my collection and it's really for the men and it has a very light um, ocean airy scent. Um, and then we have United We Stand. And this was to bring everything together. I think we're at a time where we all need to realize we are as one. And right. it has a citrus vanilla scent. And I uh -huh. chose this aroma because orange and like a citrus scent is supposed to be uplifting. And vanilla is a very calming scent to our um, sensory. So that Good was fun. Awesome. I love it. I love it. And, you know, very thoughtful in, in your process as well, right? Because that's, that's the yin and yang, right? That one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Woo. I love it. Oh, my goodness. Thank you for sharing and bringing it with, uh, to us uh, and sharing with our viewers, Jamila Shamsidin, Shamsidin, yes. uh, owner of Enhanced by Nature. Of course, that was just a sample of, of items that she has. If you want to learn more about her products, and again, that's a limited edition that we were sharing with you, you can visit uh, naturallyeverythingforlife.com. All right, yeah. don't go anywhere because Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. New Yorkers have mastered existing in crowded places and walking fast. Now is the time to master social distancing. Social distancing means creating more personal space between yourself and others, at least six feet. Creating more physical distance protects yourself and other New Yorkers from the spread of coronavirus. To do your part, stay home. Stay connected through calls, texts, and video chats. If you have to go out for essentials like food and medicine, avoid crowds and put space between yourself and other people standing in line. If you go outside, just remember to keep six feet of space between yourself and others. This is not just about you. It's also about protecting the most vulnerable and preserving the health of essential workers who are on the front lines. If you're feeling overwhelmed, connect with counselors at NYC Well. Text COVID to 692-692 for real-time updates or visit nyc.gov slash coronavirus. Sports fans, Super Bowl week, New York Giants great and media personality Tiki Barber joins us this morning to talk about the big game and a new project that he's working on. Tiki, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, Bobby. How are you? I'm doing great. A little bit cold here in New York, but excited to see the <laughs> Super Bowl this weekend. That's exactly right. I don't mind the cold. It just, I, just don't, I don't like being outside in the cold. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd rather be in the sunshine state right now. Okay. Yeah, no, down the, down there, it's going to be fun. My brother is actually going to the game, obviously, because it's in Tampa, and he's still close with the Buccaneers. So hosting that game, first time ever, really, the first time that the home team is actually in the stadium uh, hosting their own Super Bowl. So it'll be fun for all those folks down there. Well, this is definitely a dream matchup for the NFL. All-time great against an up-and-comer in the league, maybe the face of the league. What do you expect fans will see come Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, this is going to – so first of all, it's a great coaching matchup between Bruce Arians, who I've known for a long time, and he's a, he's a, he's a friend. He's always the coolest guy in the room, but he built an amazing staff that was able to make this Buccaneers team uh, pop and excel at the right times of the season. And then, obviously, Andy Reid, who I've known forever because of my he was uh, my adversary during my playing days when he was in Philly and I was with the Giants. But he's turned himself and, and justifiably into one of the best coaches in the NFL 
uh, with all of his uh, championship appearances, both in the NFC with the Eagles and the AFC with the Chiefs and Super Bowl win last year. So it, first of all, it's going to be a great coaching matchup. But then it's going to be explosive. I mean, I've, usually Super Bowls come down to you know defensive stops and and you know who can get the other team off the field uh, most effectively. But I think this one might be who can who has the ball last, who's going to score the most. Uh, obviously, it comes down to who wins, who scores the most, anyways. But this this feels like it could be a shootout because there's so many weapons with both of these offenses and their quarterbacks are so reliable. I think it's so impressive, too, when you think about it, because Patrick Mahomes is 25. He's playing at his second Super Bowl. Tom Brady, 43, playing at his 10th Super Bowl. Brady is almost as old as Patrick's father, Pat Mahomes, who used to play for the Mets. He's 50 years old. So you got some uh, you know, pretty in intense lineups there on both sides of the ball. Well, you know, it's something we've seen over the, over the last couple of years, Bobby, is just this this evolution of the quarterback. It's just they're changing, right? The old guys who we all knew, Eli and Phillip Rivers, who just retired, uh, looks like Drew Brees might re uh, hang it up as well this year. Ben Roethlisberger's right there on the edge. It's a changing of the guard that's happening at the quarterback position, and you're seeing all these young, really good players come in, and they're and they're equipped right away to play. Right. The two past MVPs have been, you know, 24 year old guys, Pat Mahomes, who you just mentioned, and Lamar Jackson. And, uh, and, and I, I think it's a it's it's I think it's good for the game uh, uh, to see the evolution of the quarterback, because Pat Mahomes is nothing like Tom Brady or or certainly not like Lamar Jackson. Uh, but the the evolution of the game has 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 made it, I think, easier for some of these young players to come in and excel, uh, just like Pat Mahomes has. So in your opinion, Tiki, what's more impressive, what LeBron James is doing at age 36 in the NBA <laughs> or what Brady is doing in the NFL at 43? You know, I would say LeBron James, um, if 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 the if Tom hadn't gotten the Buccaneers to the Super Bowl, I would have said LeBron James because look, we're always going to have that debate about you know can he ever catch Michael Jordan as the goat in the NBA? And the answer is probably no. But what he's uniquely been able to do, which is win championships in three different places and defy logic with his age and reinvent himself, no matter where he goes, from being a you know a small forward to a power forward to now he's a point guard with the Lakers uh, it's it's been amazing but Tom in, in a team sport like football where you know one superstar doesn't necessarily make you automatically a winner um, to see him grow this Buccaneers offense and you know take it to the levels that it's reached uh, this season it's 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 pretty amazing and the fact this is his 10th Super Bowl you got to you got to tip your hat to him. I don't here's the thing. I don't know if anybody else can ever do that in their career. People might be able to replicate maybe down the line some point what LeBron James has done. I don't know. I don't see how anybody does what Tom has done. You had some NFL career yourself, the all-time leading rusher for Big Blue. What is your proudest moment as a Giant? The one that sticks out most is a 2005 game against the Washington Redskins at the time. We're obviously now the Washington football team, but we played the Redskins the week after Wellington Mara passed away. And it was just this unbelievable sight. Uh, you know, the, the stands were full and packed and Kate Mara sang the national anthem, his granddaughter. And I had one of my best games of my career. I rushed for 206 yards in that game. And I was able to score a touchdown. And at the end, I gave it to one of his grandsons, Timmy McDonald, who's still with the organization. And, you know, told him this is for you and your grandparents and, um, you know, your family. And, and thank you for be making me a giant. And I'll never I'll never forget that moment because I don't know how you honor a, a man like Welling Tamara, who meant so much for the Giants, but also for the league uh, from its inception. And to have that game on that day for me and my teammates, it was it's, it's one I'll never forget. And three time Pro Bowler and, of course, New York Giants Ring of Honor member as well and, and passing some big names during your career whether it was joe morris or rodney hampton yeah career here in new york yeah so, hamp was there when i got there i remember hamp hamp was uh my first year he was there <laughs> he used to he used to because you you know where you you we practiced right at the meadowlands which was right on the hudson uh, and you it overlooked new york city he used to pull me to his sides like teak you know don't end up over there because <laughs> back in his day, they used to party over there all the time. I actually ended up living in the city, so I didn't take his advice too, too heavily. So speaking of the current team, what do you like and what don't you like about what the Giants are doing right now? 
Uh, well, I love their coaching staff. I love Joe Judge, uh, and I and I love uh, Patrick Graham, who their defensive coordinator. Jason Garrett is obviously a friend. He's a former teammate. I was on the 2000 Super Bowl team that that we went to as the Giants. So I love their staff, but I love the attitude that they've in, that they've instilled in this team. And um, look, are they deficient in talent in some places? Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose games. I think they what they've shown is that um, by being together and by not being caught up in the um, the noise that surrounds uh, this team, sometimes uh, you can achieve. And we started to see it. Uh, it was a slow, steady evolution, and they still have a long way to go. But I, I like the the mentality, the culture that Joe Judge has instilled uh, in this Giants team. And and it's only a matter of time before they get successful. If they stay healthy and they start, you know, add some pieces here or there, they're going to be a competitor in the NFC East for a long time to come. But also, you know, hopefully get to the postseason and and and, and win another championship for this organization you've got this awesome show coming up i wanted to kind of let the fans at home know about it so tell us about this social media platform and the collaboration that you've got going with amazon for a reimagined big game experience on february 7th that even includes former yankee star tina martinez sue live uh in is, is a show that i do every wednesday on sue uh, which is a so, new social media platform that shares the advertising revenue with its content creators unlike a lot of the other social platforms that make money off the content that we all post sue will share that that revenue with you and so it really empowers uh the creators and this is all kinds these are these are actual artists or or musicians or just the mom or or or, or pop or whoever it may be that has a, has a, a large following uh, so the ability to monetize uh, is, is is amazing. We are partnering with Amazon Interactive Video Services to do a Sue live type show uh, for a Super Bowl pregame. So it'll be me and Montel Williams and my brother is going to hop on and, and Tino, as you mentioned as well. And it's and it's it's going to be different from the other pregame shows that you see. One because you can view it right on your phone. Sue live pops up right on your phone in the app, so you can take it wherever you're going, and it's going to be conversations like you and me would have Bobby talking about the game it's it's not necessarily digging into the numbers and the statistics and the history it's 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 a tailgating type conversation and we'll talk food and alcohol and all the things that surround Super Bowl or the big game weekend um, and and we're excited about us I think it's gonna be a lot of fun uh, and I think people will be really engaged uh, to to be interactive and, and a part of it I think this is the wave of the future too yeah, no, it definitely is, Bobby. Look, we do it. We look, look what we're doing now. You know what I mean? We're having conversations via, uh, via a, a, a digital platform, and and now that our computers are in our hands, our cell phones are a digital platform as well. Interacting this way is 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 fantastic. Um, you know, it's just how we how we how we move about the world these days. And Sue makes it a lot easier. Not only that, but they allow you to monetize content if you're if you're creative and interesting enough. Well, Tiki, uh, the Tiki bobble head is definitely awesome, but the real Tiki barber <laughs> is much better. Appreciate you taking some time with us this morning on the show. My pleasure, Bobby. Appreciate you. I love that bobblehead, by the way. <laughs> I, I have a few of them myself. <laughs> I have a few myself. <laughs> Thanks so much for taking the time with us and uh, excited to see all of the content that you've got going this weekend. Appreciate you, Bobby. Be well, man. Welcome back. Our last guest took social media by storm with her new song, Earth is Ghetto. That's right. Her soulful voice, relatable lyrics captured the attention of so many people that it went viral on TikTok. And she's here to tell us more. Please welcome singer, songwriter, Nikki Alia. Hey. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here with us. We're so excited to get a hold of you before the rest of the world just snatches you up. Oh my goodness. OMG. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta just share like what this ride has been thus far. I mean, uh, the fact that you wrote this song, you scored this song, um, and you performed it and then all of a sudden it latched on and now it's taken on a life of its own yeah it's it did it, it has kind of taken a life of its own it got a little scary for a minute i'm like well this song is definitely out of my hands now but um what was uh, scary about it 
it was just uh, scary just seeing so many people cover it. And, uh, and at one point I was worried if I was gonna get lost as a songwriter, but people started being really good about um, making sure to credit me and mention that I was the songwriter and stuff like that. And they've been really on top of um, saying, hey, this girl wrote this song and I appreciate that. But it was like nerve wracking at first. Oh, I see. You're talking about the legalities of your song being yeah. like, duplicated without you being recognized for it because it was being covered so quickly without you even really like expanding on its development. Yeah, it was it was um, going nuts, especially since I didn't release a song yet on like Spotify and iTunes, which I plan on releasing very soon. Um, but it was definitely going nuts for a while. But I appreciate everybody that's been tagging me or letting me know that they've covered this or sending me these covers and, and sending me the different versions of the song. And it's just been a really wild ride. Yeah, well, I read the article in the Oprah magazine. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that magazine. was interesting. The, uh, um, the writer was really nice about the interview and, and um, uh, her name is Elena. She's really nice about it. Well, the story behind it is phenomenal, right? Um, it looks like you're an overnight sensation, but the truth is, is that you went to uh, Berkeley College of Music to study uh, film scoring, right? So, yeah, um, I, 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 while, like, right, yeah, right, film right, scoring right. and songwriting, and I went um, uh, maybe ten years ago now. Ten years ago, and so let's do the continuation from there. Yeah, um, I. Ten, I went for that 10 years ago and I've been um, writing music and performing for over 10 years now and just consistently sticking with music, whether I'm in a piano bar, working on a cruise ship. I did a um, cruise ship work for a while as a piano bar entertainer, you know, like Billy Joel songs and um, just stuff that people really want to hear. But I always tried to make sure that I was consistently um, performing or consistently doing music. Well, here we are in the middle of a pandemic. There's no cruise ship for you to be performing on. You came up with this song. Let's talk about that. Um, yeah, this song was an interesting experience because um, I wrote this song while I was waiting at the corner store on 15th Street by my house. And I was waiting there and I'm just thinking about the fact that this corner store has bars on the windows you can't go in the corner store because they have we have the coronavirus and everything and um since you can't go in the corner store, i'm just like this is just horrible just looking at the news and looking at tiktok videos and then i'm coming up with the lyrics while i'm walk i'm waiting in and i'm walking down the street to back to my house and like in 15 to 40 minutes i'm writing the whole song and deciding to upload the video I, the lyrics are, are like phenomenal uh, with regards to like, you know what? Yeah, I think I want to be beamed up too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I say that a lot with friends. Like um, when, I'm, when I'm talking with friends, I'm always saying, I'm not sure which the aliens would beam me up any moment now. So it's definitely uh, me consistently being conscious of what's going on in the world and just being alarmed about it. Um, maybe watching the news a bit too much and uh, obsessing about things. So it's, the, the lyrics were definitely from a place, uh, just me just being ready to be beamed up, like beam me on up right now, or anytime you want to. I got a right. right shirt, I'm here waiting. So, yeah, I yeah. can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear that you're gonna sing it fresh in, in a, a, a unique form for us here on the yes, right? I mean, everybody's yeah. already seen your video. That's already gone viral, and she's going to sing it for us here, uh, a different rendition, which I'm really looking forward to. But, you know, I wanted to just share before we, we, we take the break for, for you to perform that um, I think the fact that you wrote a song that even touches upon humanity, right? You reference aliens, and then there's the humanity aspect of what we've been enduring, um, not only with our physical health being... Um, challenged and threatened, but the, uh, the disparities, uh, the racial inequalities, the, uh, all this stuff that has come up into the forefront and it's yeah. just been an explosion of, 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 yes, I'm with you. Yeah, Earth is yeah. kind of ghetto right now. 
I had to make sure to include that in so it wouldn't just be like a joke. But um, I, I wanted to get into why I thought the earth, that earth was ghetto, why I thought, I, why I felt like I was ready to leave. So I had to, you know, include what we're going through, but I had to include um, uh, crooked police. I had to include, include um, sick people, especially with the way 2020 was going. And um, I had to just make sure I touched as many bases that I could. And we are happy you did. And we are so grateful that you have the time to do it with us here today on Open Friday. Thank you for having me. This is also my first time doing this live. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> We're looking forward to it. All right, you guys, that's Nikki Alia. That's right. And guess what? We're going to take a quick break. But uh, when we come back, Nikki Alia is going to perform the song, the viral song, Earth is Ghetto, when we return. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everyone. Welcome back here now to debut Earth is Ghetto exclusively here on OpenBXRX. Please welcome Nikki Alia. Earth is ghetto, I wanna leave, can you beat me up, I'm out on the street, gotta go to the store, you know, I know 15, got a bright shirt on, so easy to see, I've been down here saying that it left for the league, I can't reach my planet, but I need to leave, you should see these people, it's hard to believe how they treat enjoyed that. That was Nikki Alia performing Earth is Ghetto exclusively here for us on Open BXRX. If you want to learn more, you can go to I want to leave uh, Earth is Ghetto. I want to leave dot com. Excuse me. Earth is Ghetto. I want to leave dot com. And you can also check her out on Instagram at Nikki Alia. And that is our show today. Mi gente, thanks to all our guests for coming through and to our viewers for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recable Cast tonight and 24 hours a day at BronxNet.tv. I'm Lena Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor. Happy Black History Month.